record. Um, or Barb, I think you're actually going to click record. You click record. Awesome. And so we're going to start recording this presentation. And let's see. All right, Barb, am I ready to go? Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. What a joy to see more than 30 of you on this call. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Sarah Cohen, Senior Managing Director at the OTN. I think I know almost all of you, but there are a few names I don't recognize, so welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to have us gathering together, as always. Um, I'd like to take a moment um, before I move on and introduce to you Barb Thies. Uh, Barb is our new community manager for the OTN. Barb, do you want to unmute and say hi to everyone? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, again, I am Barb, the new community manager, and it's really great to see some faces uh, behind these names that I've seen in a lot of our um, community documents and such. So thanks for joining us and nice to meet you all. Thanks, Barb. Um, so as a reminder, we are recording this presentation. Um, I encourage you, if you have questions, um, to please put them into the chat. Barb is going to monitor the chat and she will gather your questions for us to um, look at once our presenters are um, finished with their part of um, our webinar. Um, if at any time during the webinar you have any tech problems, um, please also private message Barb um, and she will do her best to assist you. Um, and then as a reminder, we will be sending a link out um, tomorrow on the Google group. So if you have to, you know, dash off for whatever reason, don't worry, there will be a chance to gain the wisdom from today's presenters um, through the recording. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to take a few minutes um, to share my, oh, hold on, sorry, clicking the wrong button. That is not the share button that I wanted. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words. Um, can you see my screen? It's loading, maybe? There we go. Okay, everybody. So um, today's presentation focuses on perfecting your virtual OTN workshop. Just a few words here. Um, as a reminder, this is going to focus on the OTN workshop, but I'm sure that there's going to be plenty that you can use in any of your OER programming or general virtual presentations coming up, um, but we are going to focus today on the OTN workshop. Um, I wanted to remind all of you, um, you know this slide, this is the OTN recipe, right? So we have our um, workshops that educate faculty members about the Open Textbook Library, and we have our engagement strategy through the review system. So these three elements have been um, the OTN components for quite some time. However, now we're going to add in a new element um, for social distancing. Um, and so that's really where we're coming from. Um, how are we going to continue to engage our faculty and educate our faculty um, during this time um, of social distancing? I will say though that even when we do return to campus, which we will, at some point we will, um, that you know, virtual workshops are always an option for you. And so whether this is about COVID or not, um, this is about ways that you can engage your faculty, period. I did want to remind all of you um, that whatever challenges we face, um, in the past, this image has been a barrier, like on a road, and today I've changed it to masks and hand sanitizer. Um, I know that this is a challenging time for all of us, and we face a variety of challenges personally, professionally, um, emotionally, physically, I hope all of you are in good health and that you and yours are safe and in good health. Um, but whatever challenges you are facing and that we face as a community, we are going to tackle them as a community. And while we can't be together face to face, we are together in Zoom, we are here on the Google group and the OTN is still a strong organization that is here to support you during this time. 
with that, I'm going to hand it over to Barb. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So as you all are very familiar with, we have our OTN Community Hub that houses a number of resources to support your OER initiatives. And um, as a result of a conversation that you may have seen in the OTN Google group, um, there were some questions bubbling up about how to best deliver these virtual workshops. So based on the comments that uh, people shared, we compiled a document that kind of summarizes some of the things that we're gonna be talking about in the webinar today. Um, and that is the document here called Seven Tips for Hosting Virtual OTN Workshops that you can find at that Z link. Otherwise, it's also on the community hub and you can find it via that path. So in the resources section under workshop resources, it's linked in there. And this is a community led document. So it's a living, breathing resource that we would love your input on. If you feel that there's something missing in the content, please do feel to, to share. And we're lucky today to have three of our OTN community members um, sharing their ex expertise and experience delivering virtual OTN workshops. We have Liz Thompson, the Instructional and Educational Resources Coordinator at James Madison University. Christina Trunnell, the TRAILS OER Statewide Coordinator from TRAILS out in Montana. And then Kyle Benaxis, the Student Success Librarian at Richard Bland College of William and Mary, who is actually the only librarian on campus today. And so she's kind of dual presenting here and doing her job at the same time. So major props to Kyle. So with that, um, Liz is going to kick it off for us. Hi, all. It's great to be here this afternoon and it's great to see you all. Um, I'm going to kick us off with some tips, uh, specifically about asynchronous workshops. So my experience with online workshops has basically been the asynchronous kind. So these types of at your own pace kind of workshops that are really convenient for instructors that are off campus and that are on a really different schedule, maybe over the summertime. Um, it does mean missing out on some of those opportunities for the dynamic discussions that the, the in-person workshops prompt. Um, but because the asynchronous workshop is self-directed, um, my tips are, um, are, are very um, broad. So there are things like set clear expectations and find ways to create engaging online materials. Um, and then the last one I have is really to follow up and make sure that you're able to continue the conversation and build those relationships since you aren't able to connect really in person during the workshop. So what do I mean when I say set expectations? Um, basically, it's a lot of email. Um, uh, sending them things like um, when you're confirming the participation, um, just letting them know the approximate length of time to complete the workshop. Um, that I'm available anytime to answer questions, and then talking about those um, OTN reviews and stipends, um, being very clear about all of that information, um, and then repeating it multiple times. So <laughs> um, after the email, also on the first screen of the workshop, they get the approximate length of time to complete it. Um, they also get learning objectives. So trying to set them up at the very beginning before they even get started so that they understand the process that they're gonna be going through um, and what they're going to be getting out of it. And then um, one of my favorite questions actually in our online workshop, Kyle and I developed this together, um, was, and it was Kyle's suggestion to ask them at the very beginning how they're feeling about taking the workshop. And so even though it's an online workshop and they're doing it at their own pace and they're doing it and, and I'm not there to really gauge how they're feeling, we still get kind of a little look at, to see how they're feeling about it, which is fantastic. Um, and then at the end of the workshop, also setting them up to continue the conversation. So there is a post-workshop survey that they do at the end where they have an opportunity to talk about how the structure of the workshop was for them, but then also to um, ask a lot of those questions that just naturally bubble up when you're having the in-person conversations. So um, 
that kind of um, communication at the offset, I think, kind of helps to build the relationship, even though you're not actually engaging directly with people during the workshop. Um, but talking about engagement throughout the workshop, that can be more than just text. So um, thinking about things like, um, or just putting up a slide deck. So thinking about things like videos or podcasts or infographics to really um, hit home those concepts that can be a little difficult for people to, um, to work through on their own. Um, I especially like the podcasts, if you can find instructors that have talked about moving to open textbooks on their own in the process that they went through um, and the benefits and the result of all the work that they put in. Those can be really uh, fantastic resources. Um, and then we built in uh, questions throughout the uh, the workshop. So as you go from screen to screen, there's um, check-ins to see um, if the information um, has has kind of trickled in. Um, and so they're formative questions in that there's immediate feedback. So for instance, there's a question about Creative Commons licenses. And one of the answers is, are they all rights reserved? And so when they choose that as an answer, they'll get a pop-up window that prompts them to try again. <laughs> and then they can um, actually, it, it points them to the part of the video that explains about open licenses also. So <laughs> not only does it prompt them to try again, but it actually sends them back to the, the right spot in the slide for them to, to, to find the answer. Um, so there's opportunities for them to provide um, reflective comments, um, which I think is also important when um, you're kind of going a process like this alone to be able to spend time and reflect. Um, and then one of the nice things about having the questions in there, not only for the folks that are participating, but also then, um, for me, I've been able to go back in and see areas where it looks like um, the majority of people have maybe struggled a little bit. And so it gives an opportunity then to update the content and make it um, more uh, clear, uh, easier to understand, um, and just kind of address those points um, on a regular basis. So you have kind of an opportunity to create some engagement in a way that um, isn't necessarily, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so at the very end, following up, um, when the workshop's closed, um, I actually take an opportunity to kind of parse the information that people have provided through answering the questions throughout the workshop, um, through their post-workshop survey responses. And so um, I try to actually break the content up and not send one mass email to people. Um, gives me an opportunity to touch base with people on multiple points um, after the fact, but also I think one of the things that's really nice about it is that um, you can, um, instead of a massive information dump <laughs> in just one mass email, I think things can get lost that way. Um, it's nice to kind of parse that and to chunk it up. Um, so you can follow up with them about maybe um, questions that they had about Creative Commons or about the five R's or about um, publishing models, things like that. Um, but then also you can provide maybe like a discrete email that's all about the OTN review siphon process <laughs> so that people um, have those things and they're very clearly distinguishable. So yes, we do ask again at the end how they feel. And sometimes it's different, sometimes it's not. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's um, one of the feelings that they can have is skeptical. They've been happy, they've been uh, confused, they've been excited. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings involved with that question. So um, those were the tips that I have um, for going the asynchronous route. Um, Christina, I think you've done something a little different. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. Okay, so um, all of mine have been synchronous and live that I've done. And um, to kind of build off of where Liz started us out with, 
um, the first thing that I would uh, recommend is to um, kind of define your expectations. So uh, Liz talked about asking um, attendees their expectations, um, but I think when you're planning a virtual workshop, it's really important to start off with what do I really want um, participants to engage in? What are the main things that I want them to get? And yes, while we want them to hang on our every word, uh, <laughs> those like key points are really great places to put a pause in your presentation. And so um, I learned long ago from teaching classes online that you can't expect someone to engage for a long period of time without breaking it up. And so with the OTN slide deck, I, I have breaks about every eight to 10 minutes um, as we go through with a question. And that can look very different depending on what you're comfortable with. Um, sometimes I just ask them, you know, uh, to think about their first experience with um, teaching and selecting a textbook and I give them kind of a beat to think about it and then I move on so that they're putting something like an application in mind as they're listening to the next section. Um, or I ask them to do a little online poll where I put a, a question in the slide deck and ask them to just um, indicate uh, one, two, or three, their answer to it. So it kind of gives them moments throughout the presentation to interact. And those I have very much synced with my expectations of things that I want them to really understand. Um, so another thing that I like to do uh, that I found is really beneficial um, is using the OTN format when they register. And I do all my registration through a Google Doc. So I have a record whether they actually attend or not of everybody's information. Um, but I always ask their discipline. And depending on the size of the group that you have participating, um, I use that to bring up examples. So if I know most of my participants are stats, you know, instructors, then I'll spend a little bit more time talking about, um, you know, the slide with Barbara Ilowski's stats textbook and, and, and applications and give them maybe some space to talk about within the presentation uh, other ways that they would improve their current textbooks that they're using, their publisher textbooks, things that their textbooks um, don't have that they have to generate. Uh, so it's getting them to kind of engage with their own instruction while they're listening to the value of what you're presenting. Um, that really helps me as well. Um, one thing that I found with online presentations is they don't have the um, participants don't have the energy that you normally would share in person as as you know we get excited about what we do or why we believe in this work um, and so one way to get them to kind of fill some of that energy is to use stories um, or examples might be a better way to say it so something that i often do is um, pull for um, every few slides, I pull a specific example. And it doesn't have to be something that I did. Um, it can be, but um, I pull examples uh, from faculty that I've worked with or faculty that I've talked with or people in the OTN that I've talked with. You know, hey, I know this instructor who um, couldn't find a textbook and wouldn't write one, but here's this other way that we helped them. And here's how OER fit. And so not long stories, but just examples to make it applicable and relevant to them um, and kind of break up the information overload that online teaching tends to have. So um, I think giving yourself the space to kind of maybe not say everything you would normally doing a face-to-face -face workshop, but um, connecting people more with the material in a virtual workshop is really important. Um, and that's where I also use like uh, when they register their disciplines. So I can, if I see that, you know, maybe I only have three faculty in that workshop and they're from these three disciplines, I'll pick examples from those disciplines so that again, they feel more connected 
to what the workshop is teaching. Um, student feedback, uh, because I've had the opportunity to teach for years, I have a lot of student comments that I can pull in, um, but not everybody has that <laughs> experience. So utilize other um, OTN institutions student feedback. Student has, uh, you know, um, this library has some student comments on their website and, and things like that. You can use those comments as here's what students have to say about this. It doesn't have to be a student you know. <laughs> Right? It doesn't have to be a student that was in your class or uh, that you worked with personally, but maybe this instructor told you about or someone else at the OTN told you about. Um, so use those student feedbacks to really, uh, or quotes or faculty quotes to reiterate your points. Um, helps it to be relevant. And then the last thing I want to um, really talk about is follow up. Uh, Liz mentioned that. I know Kyle's going to mention that too. Um, the first couple of virtual workshops I taught, one of the biggest challenges I had was getting information back to the participants quickly enough because once the workshop's over, you have 80 other things waiting to do. So um, the lesson that I have learned <laughs> is that you need to have your follow-up responses ready to go before the workshop. And that could be a draft email. Um, it could be a form. So I typically use an FAQ form that I've created um, that has links to those questions that are most commonly asked, right? Here's some Creative Commons information. Not that I expect them to read it right away, but I want them to have it at hand. So when they refer back to that workshop, they, oh, here's the details I needed. Um, I customize it each time. So if something specifically came up during the Q&A, um, I can add those details. Or if we got off on a tangent during Q&A and I said, oh, I'll share this with you, I can add that in really quickly. But um, I have those responses generated beforehand. And there's a lot of ways to do it with email or using Google Forms to generate that response or um, the data dashboard or some other things that um, softwares that people use, but having that pre-created and populated is incredibly helpful in making sure that you follow up the way that um, you would like to. So that the last, okay, I did say the last thing. So the last, last thing. I always end um, workshops with an acknowledgement of their humanity, um, their time limitations, the workload that um, changing your course materials is, and even if they're just reviewing a textbook, uh, whether they get a stipend or not. So um, I do workshops for public and private institutions, and the private institutions I can't give stipends to, um, but they still do the workshops and write reviews. Um, and do adoption. So uh, whatever their level of engagement is, I want to acknowledge that they're giving something really strongly to their students and their community, and they don't always have to do it all at once. And so I know I've heard um, so many people say, you know, you don't have to write a textbook to participate. And, and it's a good thing to reiterate, but also acknowledging you're putting a lot of time and effort into this and that's valuable. And the benefit is for you as well as for your students. And then I thank them for that. So um, to me, that acknowledgement and the, the gratitude for their participation, not in my workshop, but in this work as a field is really important to me. And that's how I end every workshop. So, and I did see Emily, um, your question, I will share out the document that I send um, and work with Barb, we can maybe make one for OTN as well. Just to chime in there, we could add it to the bottom of the seven tips document so that it's all in one place. So we'll Perfect. connect on that after. Yeah. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Hi, everyone. Is, is my audio good? Just want to check. All right. So I, my part is 
at the college that I'm at, we are a very, very small faculty. So I have, I'm lucky to have the opportunity that I can kind of build that connection with my faculty. So my three points are all about how I can continue to build that connection, especially in a virtual format. So one of my main tips when I first started doing, and I made, I worked with Liz, it was Liz's idea to make the, um, workshop and she said I was like any who's interested in making the workshop and I said I am because I'm swamped and I'd really like to do this workshop but I don't know if I can do consistent in-person workshops so the first thing I wanted to do was always make sure that I'm mindful of like the faculty's time and not only that but my time so it's kind of very easy to think that okay now it's a virtual workshop I can put in all the information that I want into the workshop and make it fit and make sure they have all of the information that's available and with that you, it's it, it goes to say that not a lot of people have the attention span to <laughs> keep up with a lot of the information that comes in a virtual format their eyes gloss over and they might not sit and listen to a full you know several hour video or multiple videos so i try to keep the workshop within the same amount of time the in-person workshop would be no matter how tempting it is to go into full detail about creative commons and go through all of the details about the open textbook network i try to keep it within the 40 minutes to an hour and how I managed to do that was when we made the workshop I had some of my my student workers actually take the workshop because me I've done the workshop I can answer it quickly get it done in 20 minutes but to my student workers who are not familiar with the subject they actually had to go through and it watch the videos listen to the podcast answer the questions and it came to about 40 45 minutes maybe an hour if you were actually you know spending a lot more time on some of the slides. So use that time when you're making the workshop is, is there anything that you can put in maybe supplemental material? So when I teach library instruction, I'm really big on giving my students flyers. So when they're done with the instruction, you have a flyer you can take that has kind of some cliff notes on everything we talked about. I did the same thing for my virtual workshop. So after they finish, the workshop I have I give them material and I'm really into QR codes there's a lot of free QR code websites where you can make them so they get a flyer with a QR code they can if they're on their computer if they want to print it out then they can just snap it on their phone and it takes them either to the libguide if they want to do the workshop again um, the open textbook network uh, page um, in Virginia, we have the course redesign grant, also goes to the course redesign grant, so they can have that material that they can take with them into whatever they're going to do with the information that I just gave them in the workshop. What I like about this is it builds a rapport that you can spend more time interacting with them in the in the virtual format outside of the workshop. So I don't have to spend a whole lot of time giving them a lot of information that they could easily read or look up. Um, Another tip is to continue relying on faculty champions, even if you don't have any, this is a good time to try to get some. When I first did the asynchronous workshop, I got so many emails with really, really great quotes from professors that said, wow, this workshop really helped me. Um, I got a lot of insight on OERs. I had one faculty member that said he doesn't want to he, he only wants to publish in open access journals now. I like opened up his life. I don't know. But he, he really, I use that quote every time I talk about my asynchronous website whenever, or asynchronous workshop. Whenever I advertise it, I asked him, I said, can I use your quote that you said? He said, yeah, go ahead. So every time I send it out in an advertisement, he had, I put those quotes in and use that virtual workshop to put some of those quotes in. Um, how I also organize my workshop is the asynchronous version is where they learn a lot about the open textbook network and I follow up and ask them if they want to zoom with me and when they zoom with me they kind of get that one-on-one -on -one experience of going through looking at the textbooks answering any questions they might have that they might not have wanted to ask in the we use LibWizard in the LibWizard or send me in an email. So I use that opportunity to kind of invite them in. And sometimes I've had some faculty that are say, hey, I'll sit in with this new faculty member. We have um, a biology faculty and he always invites all of his other professors. So 
when I do the one-on-one -on -one with the new person, he'll like to sit in and kind of chime in and talk about it as well and his experience with um, writing reviews or looking through the, the different books. And when I use some of, when I make um, like PowerPoints or if I'm making the, the um, the advertisements, either the sign up sheets or the little graphic that goes into a mass email. I include those faculty members and I ask, I, I ask them if I could use them. I don't just, you know, put it up there, but I do ask them and they've always been very helpful. So if you can keep a list of those, save them, put them in a file somewhere in your emails because <laughs> they're very, very beneficial to you. And finally, the biggest one is to keep and take advantage of that open communication channel. Um, doing the workshop while it is beneficial in person, we have a lot of faculty here at Richard Bland that's swamped with other stuff. A lot of our innovative faculty, they're in so many committees, they, they're teaching kind of all the classes, they're really, really busy with a lot of things. So they might not always have the time to come to an in-person workshop. So when they sign up for the workshop, I ask them if they're interested in other things, either if they're interested in grant opportunities, if they're interested in learning more about textbooks that are available to them. Um, I'm signed up on a bunch of listservs, so when I see that there's new textbooks on subjects, sometimes I like to keep them and put them in a, in a document. I'll just copy and paste the link, put it in a document. So I ask them if they want that or if they're interested in something like that. And what I end up doing is I don't I don't flood their emails with information. I usually keep it maybe one email a semester or depending on what's going on. So for like the beginning, the fall, maybe in the winter when they're thinking about what their new books for the next semester is during open ed week. And then for the summer, I'll maybe uh, put in an email and talk about, you know, what's going on in OER news. I'll talk about open textbook network. I'll remind them. Um, if they if they forgot about some things, I also um, the uh, the bibliography that's provided by the OT, and I also include that in their very first email that they get after taking the workshop. So if they want to go back and look at read some of the studies, or if they want to review the slides without having to, you know do all the questions and answers again. I allow them to do that. So if they wanna look over the material again, and any points that I wanna highlight, I keep, I keep in that. And that's really helped them kind of stay connected. And with that, I get a lot of faculty that, oh, now it's time for me to pick my book. Oh, now I have the chance to maybe look into OERs. Cause that sometimes with some faculty, you just, you do the workshop and then you move on to your next thing. Like I did that and now I'm done, but with this, they, I kind of trigger them and they're able to be reminded. And now that they have the time, kind of at the end of the semester when grades are due, they're more willing to come in and, and talk with me or Zoom with me. I've had a lot of Zooms about it where I'll sit and we'll go through the Open Textbook Network workshop and we'll go through the website and we'll look at books and they'll say, well, okay, how do I do that? Is there any supplemental material? And I say, yeah, this is how we do it. We can keep looking. This is the steps that you go through and that's really helpful for them. And so the biggest thing with that is you've given, you've, you've made yourself open and you've made yourself available for them to come to you. And it's kind of comforting to them that they have, you know, if they come to you for a question through email, you'll respond to them and you're, you're willing to work with them through that time. So you don't always have to rely on the, the workshop format. Um, I'd encourage you to even if you have the ability to, and if you can, and if you have the time, invite them in for a second one that's maybe less formal where you actually, actually can kind of have that conversation you would normally have in the workshop. I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Kyle and Liz and Christina. Um, Amy had a great question that I'm just gonna, she said Kyle kind of addressed it, but in case Liz um, or Christina wants to chime in, and it was in reference to asynchronous workshops, um, wondering if uh, you receive asynchronous, um, or sorry, if you could speak to how it feels in terms of community building or connecting faculty to colleagues when you are conducting an asynchronous workshop. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit um, to me because I do both. I, I do the in-person workshops. I do one in the fall semester and one in the spring semester. 
Um, I, were, I really wanted to design the asynchronous one to catch the instructors when they're off campus in the summertime redoing their courses, like really thinking about making changes and they have that time. Most of them um, will take the time over the summer to do that. So um, what I found is with the asynchronous courses, the um, conversations leading up to the workshop are very similar in nature to my in-person. But then afterwards, you just have to really make the effort to make the connection and to, which is why I, I kind of use the in, um, in workshop question responses and post workshop survey responses that I get to help kind of remind them <laughs> to connect again with them and say, hey, I saw that you had questions about Creative Commons or you weren't really sure who else you know, how other people in biology are using these open textbooks and being able to point them to some of the literature, you know, some of the, those types of things. So um, it's, it's the, during the in-person workshops, you're able to really have those conversations and put faces with names and really kind of um, get a better sense for what their individual goals are. And so, on the asynchronous side, the follow-up takes a very different route. Does that help? I've had for us, um, like my work, my my in-person workshop really reaches out to the full-time faculty, but my asynchronous one is really good for adjunct faculty who might not be on campus or they work at other institutions, so they can really have that opportunity that they might not have when they're full-time on campus. And also with that, it kind of, at least for us, not a lot of our adjuncts get, you know, orientations to OERs or they might not come to like professional development where I usually do these, the OTN workshop. And so that brings them into the library space and they know, hey, I'm in here to help you and you can spend this time to come and we can look through and identify OERs or look through the websites together rather than kind of feeling like they're isolated or they have to wait till, you know, the faculty the full-time faculty maybe bring them in. So I found that's helped with really getting a lot of the faculty that might not necessarily be involved a lot on campus and participate in a lot of either professional development or committees or meetings. So um, my asynchronous attempts have not been things that I'm happy with, so I'm I'm still working on a method that works for me, but um, I, to build off of what Liz and Kyle just said, I think the follow-up is a really a key thing to connecting faculty as a part of the community, whether they're doing a virtual workshop live or synchronous or asynchronous. Um, and one thing that I found is really helpful um, for every workshop that I do, I put a, a calendar date six months down the road um, on my calendar that then I um, send a follow-up like just checking in hey you know you didn't adopt but you did write a textbook review reminding myself of who participated and connecting with them um, the other thing that I do as a follow-up is at that six month mark I um, will send out emails to them and and again how many people are participating and this can be a challenge, so acknowledge that in the time it takes. But um, I also will send them, when I send that um, email follow-up, I will also copy their campus librarian. So um, Trails is a statewide consortium, so I work with 27 campuses. So I'll set, connect them with their um, campus librarian and their campus department. So say, hey, it's really great that this person participated in a virtual workshop. Are you still doing that? This is something you should talk to your department about and kind of connect some pieces. So if there's a faculty in that department that's already working on OER, that's the person I connect with. If not, I send it to the department chair. Um, and again, recognizing time and resources. So I, I do have student workers at my disposal that can get those contacts for me. Um, that will be different depending on the size of your institution, how that works. But connecting them, even if it's an adjunct who teaches 
one class a semester or a term, connecting them with other people at their institution to say, hey, they're doing great things, um, I think is valuable as well. You mentioned the director chairs. I even, I advertise, like I specifically hosted like a, um, like the faculty chair only workshop to kind of get like from the top down. So they saw it and then they would tell like the other faculty about it. And I think that was kind of one of the biggest pushes for um, our director of academics was once the department of chair for one of the natural, for the natural sciences. And every time she reaches out to, talk about either course adoption or textbook adoptions and everything she always mentions um, looking at OERs and she talks about the, the OTN workshop that she went to so I reached out to the department chairs and asked if they wanted their own kind of private one to get them on. Great. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we recognize we've got some great insights from our three panelists here and then we also recognize that a number of you who are in attendance have likely also done some sort of either virtual OTN workshop or other um, virtual workshop. So we were hoping that this last, what is it, 15 minutes or so could be an opportunity for uh, other community members to perhaps share any insights that they've found useful that we may not have covered here, or certainly um, please do keep sending questions you may have for the panelists. And then while maybe some of you are typing suggestions, we've got the link up on this slide once again for that seven tips document, which um, as mentioned earlier, we'll get I'll get in touch with Christina and add her um, example slide deck to that document so that you have access to that. Barb, I have a question for our, for our um, panelists. I'm just wondering. This was really helpful, and I just wonder um, if there's anything in particular that any piece of advice that you would give to people kind of as, as you're thinking, as you prepared for this presentation today and started thinking more, you know, explicitly about the work that you do for virtual workshops, is there anything that is striking you as particularly, I don't know, worth revisiting or rethinking or adapting, um, knowing that everyone is now virtual and everyone is in Zoom all the time? Um, is is there anything that, that kind of is sticking for you um, as, as you kind of prepare to, to do this in this new environment? I think I would probably add a more personal component to my workshop. Um, right now how it is it's like a lot of infographics and videos from youtube and a podcast but i think maybe i would have put a couple of slides where um i think screen i think it's called screencastify where you can record in the browser or on your window and talk over it and it's kind of like a, a recording of yourself i would include maybe something from me on it so that way a lot of the like for since it reaches out to a lot of adjuncts a lot of them have not seen me or met me they just see me through email so I would have added maybe a personal part of it so they know who I am and they can recognize me yeah I like that Kyle I was also thinking too that now that people are more adjusted to this type of connection, <laughs> um, maybe it's worthwhile to try a virtual, like what Christy has been doing, the synchronous over the summer. Um, I don't know, maybe people are burned out on that, but then again, um, I think last summer I was thinking it would be difficult because people aren't really used to connecting in that way. And it might be kind of difficult to get everybody in the same space at the same time, but I feel like now it might be kind of cool to give people a choice, right? Would you prefer to do it in person or would you prefer to do it at your own pace? So here are your choices, so. Um, I think, and, and Kathy asked another question, is there anything that used to work that doesn't now so much online? <laughs> um, and, and I think that one thing that I, 
I really have been looking at how to work into my um, uh, textbook review workshops and, and of the workshops I've been doing, those are the least attended right now because I think faculty are just so bombarded with information um, trying to get their classes ready. Uh, but the thing that um, I've been really thinking um, needs a place in my slide deck, um, but I haven't really figured it out is just an acknowledgement of um, how different student needs are now, right? Our students, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge the pandemic and that our students probably are going um, without jobs, without income, you know, it's put a different weight on the transition um, and the need to transition. And so I think if I were to keep doing them the same and didn't acknowledge that, it would be missing a piece. Um, and I don't know if others feel differently. Um, the other thing I've done for the last couple of workshops that I did in the last two weeks is about 20 minutes in, like asked everyone to stand up and turn off their cameras and just like move for a minute. <laughs> and that got like really great, <laughs> great cheers because a lot of people are sitting and doing these, you know, meetings and workshops every day, all day, and, and they're just not moving. And so, I did like a little 30 second um, like music beat and <laughs> ask people to stand up and just like move or shake or don't if they're not comfortable. But we like took a little movement break um, before the, you know, halfway between the start and the Q&A session. And that got people like cheering a little bit. So <laughs> yeah, but I think acknowledging uh, for me, the thing that I would change based on Qu Kathy's question is to really acknowledge there's more pressure and more need and more desperation for not just online teaching, but affordable teaching options. So. Thank you, Christina. Does that mean we need a movement break? <laughs> Everyone stand up and do five <laughs> I think we are there. <laughs> <laughs> And that really honestly just comes from having to sit with my children while they do schoolwork and I work, we have to require each other to get up and move. Yeah. Great. Anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? Thank you, Carla. I'm glad you're standing and stretching right now. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank so much um, Liz, Kyle, and Christina. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. I think that, you know, something that really strikes me about what you're talking about, um, and I really appreciate the way in which you, you're continuing to focus on connection, um, and I think that's so important. Um, as you all know from, from the OTN perspective, that's what so much of this is about. Um, so thank you for emphasizing that and showing us ways we can do that in the virtual environment. I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the way in which many of you shared your behind the scenes work. Um, you know, these ideas around marking your calendar or the ways that you're following up with people. Um, I do want to remind everyone that the data dashboard is available and, and should still be used even for online workshops you can, instead of putting the room that you were going to meet in, you can put the Zoom room that you were going to meet in um, and continue to use that as um, a way to manage your workshop and the review process. Um, in wrapping up, I did, oh, I'm sorry about the way I'm using my <laughs> screen share. Um, we do have a few other upcoming events. Um, next week, we're having a community conversation on inclusive access. Um, this is going to be much less about best practices and experiences by people that have are doing it and is really a chance for people in the OTN to share what you're hearing on your campus around inclusive access right now. Um, Bob Butterfield and Cheryl Coolier will be joining that call. Um, they wrote uh, inclusive access talking points for us um, in the OTN last year. So we'll revisit that document, but it's much more of a conversation. Um, so please feel free to join us on Wednesday at noon central. 
on Thursday next week, um, we have our office hours. Um, and this, uh, this office hours will focus on budgeting OER production. And that is on Thursday, the 21st at one o'clock central. And then just to blow off some steam, um, we are hosting um, our biweekly OTN happy hour on the 21st at 4 p.m. Central. Those are super fun. There's not an agenda. It's just a chance to see each other and talk to each other and connect with one another. Um, and that really is um, my parting thought to all of you. Um, we've got this and it's really about we. Um, stay together, take care of each other, um, join in the community. Please reach out on the Google group if you have questions or ideas or suggestions, um, or you just want to reach out to other people doing the work, um, be part of our community and connect with one another. And as always, we are here if you have any questions. Um, sorry, see, I got to work on my, my skills with my mouse. Um, the contact info for our presenters today, um, and of course for me and for Barb. So that is it from us, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to see so many of you joining us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute. Otherwise, we hope we'll see you next week um, at another event. High five, everybody. Thank you. Yay. Good to see you guys. Thank you all so much.